What's up everyone? Today I'm going to be answering one of the most common questions I get, which is how do I set up my desktop environment? So I'm not going to worry too much about contentious conversations about whether it's right to run Windows alongside Linux or whether it's right to run Arch versus other operating systems. I would just say do what works for you. I happen to really like this setup. I use Arch as my primary driver for 98% of my use cases. It's super minimal. It lets me compose kind of like my own distribution that meets my needs. So I love it for that. And it also doesn't try to abstract away too much of the weeds. So I get to learn a lot in the process. And then I also use Windows just in case there's something for work that I need Windows for. It doesn't really happen too often, but it has happened a couple times. Now, I'm going to be setting this up on my personal laptop. This is the same setup I use for personal devices and work devices. Now, my setup is a dual boot with Arch and Windows. Both are fully encrypted, independent of one another. And also, I use Grub, the bootloader, to select which operating system I want to boot into. So today, I'm going to try to give you the most succinct description of how to set this up. And I think you'll find it to be not as challenging as it might sound at, uh, at or seem at face value. So the only prereqs you have for this are to have installation media for Windows and for Arch Linux. On my website, not only do I have information about the installation media, but I've got uh, details and snippets on every single step I'm going to do here with you today. So if you set this up for yourself, you might find that website really helpful. The link will be in the description. So let's get started. The first thing I need to show you is the BIOS of the machine. So I haven't done much to my personal ThinkPad other than gone in and disabled Secure Boot. Uh, Secure Boot is not a feature that I personally need or like. You can set up Arch Linux to boot in Secure Boot mode if you need to, um, but those are some extra steps that you'll have to decide whether that's important to you. And then in BIOS, I've also set the boot mode as UEFI only. Most are going to support UEFI and uh, a BIOS mode or legacy boot mode. UEFI is kind of the newer standard. It works really well. I just highly recommend you use that. And then finally, there is a device key F12, which I'll be using a lot like right now, where we boot into the Windows partition. So let's go ahead and plug the Windows USB in here. And this is just a Windows 10 ISO that I grabbed from Microsoft's website. So we'll see if I can get this plugged in. Good, good. We will go ahead and restart and I'll be hitting F12 now to make sure that I get to the boot menu. All right. Now, inside of the boot menu, I'll select the USB. You might be wondering why we're starting with Windows and the primary reason is that this is a little bit of an easier place to start from because Windows has some opinions on how the partition layout goes. And it just so happens that the partition layout it puts in place is something that we can just build on top of with Linux. So it's going to set up a partition for EFI. It's going to set up a partition for um, its Windows partitions and stuff and just give us a bunch of free space that we can use with Linux as well. So again, I find starting with Windows to be a much easier process. There's nothing too special about the Windows installation process other than we need to specify the disk space we're going to use. So I'll show you where that menu option is in a moment here. So we'll accept the agreement. We'll go down to a custom install. And the key is to do the custom install because we need to go through and delete every single one of the existing partitions. We're going to start totally fresh here and we'll delete all of these. And then we're just going to have a big blob of unallocated space available to us. So let's do that now. All right, so we've got the 200 or so gigs available to us. We just go to new in the installer and it's gonna ask us what size we want. So for size, this is the amount you're gonna allocate for the Windows install. I'm gonna give it somewhere, oops. Let me see if I can cancel that real quick. I'm gonna give it somewhere in the wheelhouse. What did I hit? Okay, let me try that again. So uh, I'm gonna give it somewhere in the wheelhouse of like 99 gigabytes. It's probably gonna be a little bit less than that. And then we'll apply this and then Windows will say, hey, can I create some partitions? We'll say, okay. And then Windows is going to set up what it thinks the partition table should look like. Now, most important to Linux, it's going to set up a partition too. This is the system or the EFI partition. And this will be helpful for when we set up things like Grub and Arch EFI boot instructions. In partition four is where Windows will go. In partition or non-existent partition space is where we're going to eventually put Linux. So let's go ahead and go to next. And now we're going to install Windows. So once this installation is complete, we are going to hop in and do some configuration along with encrypt the Windows partition that we have set up. 
All right, now I'm just gonna go through the Windows configuration. This is just selecting languages and stuff like that, nothing too special, so I won't bother recording it. But in a moment, we'll meet up in a fully booted Windows environment where we'll finish configuring and then set up encryption. All right, so we've officially booted up into Windows. The first thing we're gonna do, actually the only real configuration we need to do is open up control panel and go to power. Inside of power, there is a change what the power buttons do option. And inside of here, you want to disable the fast startup option. This prevents Windows from shutting down completely when you ask it to shut down, which can have bad impacts on Linux and your ability to switch between Linux and Windows. But as far as Windows 10 goes at the time of this recording, that's about it. That's all the configuration you need to do. Now I'm gonna assume you also want to encrypt as I do. So we're gonna open up a web browser for a moment here and we're gonna search for a utility that I'm apparently misspelling called Veracrypt. And Veracrypt is a free and open source disk encryption software. Windows does have a way to encrypt, but for some reason you can only get it in certain flavors of Windows or something, I don't really know. I've been using Veracrypt for a really long time now. Love it, it's a great project. Seems to work super, super well. So we're gonna run the installer for Veracrypt. We'll get out of here. We'll give Veracrypt the details or security permissions it needs more so. And then we'll just go ahead and run the installer. So and the installer is just to get the Veracrypt software to do the encryption. So next, next, install, looking good. We'll exit out of here, hopefully. Close these tabs, cool. And it says it's installed. All right, good. And they have a donate page if you do end up using this and liking it. So. Let's go ahead and open up Veracrypt. Now, Veracrypt is a very capable piece of software, but all we need to do is go to system and choose to encrypt the entire system partition because we want all of Windows to be encrypted. So we will hit yes again to permissions. For the initial screen with Veracrypt, not a whole lot you gotta do here other than hit next for normal mode, encrypt the Windows system partition. And for the number of operating systems, while it might seem counterintuitive, we're gonna choose single boot here. We don't want Veracrypt to know anything about Linux. We're gonna use a tool in Linux called Lux to set up encryption there. So we'll do single boot and then next again. And you can choose your encryption option here. I'll leave it up to you to determine what's best for you. We'll put in a password and this password is what you're gonna to use to unlock the disk. It'll yell at me probably that my password's are not very secure, but that's okay. And then it's gonna want you to move your mouse and you know make hardware actions happen so it can generate enough entropy to create the keys it needs to encrypt. Once you've done that, you can hit next and next pass the keys. All right, and then you also have the option of making a rescue disk. I do recommend doing this if you care a lot about your Windows partition. I rarely use it, but you can hit, uh, you can go through this process and on a USB stick have a rescue drive set up. So if you ever forget your password or have issues, you could theoretically get back into your drive. For white mode, this will give you the option to overwrite all of the uh, existing bits with random zeros and ones. I don't care about that. I'm not worried about the security of this drive. I'm just gonna do white mode none and just encrypt it as is. And then lastly, we're gonna kick off the pretest here. The pretest is gonna reboot the machine, and the pretest is really good to make sure you didn't mess anything up. So what it's gonna do once it boots back up is give me a tiny password dialog. In that password dialog, I need to put in my password, and if I put it in correctly, Windows will boot back up and we'll be set to start the encryption. But if it fails, it's good because uh, Veracrypt has not gone in and encrypted the whole drive yet. So it's not like I've potentially hosed my whole system. I'm still in kind of this pre-test mode more or less. So if you look in the top left of my screen here, you see the password just popped up. I know the text is a little small here. We'll just go ahead and pop through it. And if all goes well, it'll authenticate us and boot us right back into Windows. Okay, so we're back in the system here. Now we just need to log in and let's put in the right pin. Now, what should happen if all went well is after we sit at the Windows desktop for just a moment here, in you know, probably less than a minute, we'll get a pop-up from Veracrypt saying, hey, test completed, looking good. Do you wanna go ahead and encrypt the hard drive? Which is exactly what we'd like to do. And we're very close to being done with Windows at this point. So we'll just click encrypt. We will say okay to their agreements and yes to the privileges they need and encryption now starts. So that's it. So now we just gotta watch the paint dry for encryption. Once this encryption's done, we're ready to boot over into our Arch ISO and start the installation of Linux. Okay, so now we're all good. The machine restarted, Veracrypt said the pretest went well and it's fully encrypted the drive now. 
So we will finish and we're ready to restart the computer. Now I should mention with the restart that I'm pulling out the USB for Windows and I'm gonna be plugging in the uh, USB for Arch now. So I'll plug that in, good. And we are ready to restart the machine. So similar to before, I'm gonna hit F12 many, many times. This should ensure that I get to the boot menu again, at least on Lenovo and their motherboards, that seems to work just fine. Okay, we're entering the boot menu now. Okay, so we'll go down to the USB HDDD. All right, so now we're inside of the Arch uh, kind of boot menu, if you will, it's probably grub based. So, this boot menu you'll notice says UEFI. So you wanna be careful if your boot menu looks a lot different than this, are you booting in UEFI mode? And if you're not, do you know what you're doing? So with this mode here, we're looking pretty good overall. One little pro tip I'll give you, if you hit E on this first menu item, it's gonna give you the command it's gonna run. Now on high resolution monitors, and frankly, most modern monitors, the text of the installer is gonna show up really small. There's many ways to fix this. I think there's a really easy way though, and that is to type in no mode set video equals, and then give it a resolution you're comfortable with. So I usually do 1280 by, let's say like 760. And sure, it's not gonna be the most beautiful text you've ever seen in your life, but it's gonna be nice and large, and you're actually gonna be able to tell what you're typing in. All right, so once this boots up and it's seen the ISO, it's kind of booting into UEFI mode, if all goes well, we're gonna kind of start with two steps. The first thing is, you know, the USB obviously doesn't come with every package, everything that I need. So we're gonna rely on the internet to get a lot of those packages in this install. So connecting to the internet will be crucial. If we can get on the internet, I'm then gonna show you how I set up Arch on a machine using a different machine, which might seem a little weird, but I don't really like completing the install in the super limited terminal. I like to have access to an internet browser and copy and paste and my editors and things like that. So I'll show you how to set that up, although it is an, a completely optional step, that's up to you whether you want to actually implement that. Okay, it looks like we are good to go. So let's just make sure we don't have internet connectivity to start ourselves off. It appears we don't. Now there's a, a kind of really simple tool set in here that uses systemd. It's called NetCTL and it lets us connect to the internet. And we're gonna start off by using one of its utilities. So I'm on a ThinkPad laptop. And if I had an ethernet cable, honestly, just plug in an ethernet cable. It's, it makes it much simpler. But luckily we can use this tool called Wi-Fi menu. And assuming we don't have some obscure, uh, you know, uh, wireless card that doesn't have the drivers supported. We should be able to just select our network in here, hit enter. And then once we put in the password for our network, we should be able to connect to the internet. Okay, so theoretically we should be connected to the internet. So let's do an IPAS. You can see under interface number three, I have an INET, an IP address associated with it. So that's 192.168.194. We can ping Google and make sure we're online. All is looking great. So since we're online, what we're going to do now is we're going to SSH into this box. This is that remote thing I was trying to tell you about. So here's the idea. First things first, set a password for the root user. This is just for your USB stick, your, your media, right? It's not gonna persist into your end system. So put in an arbitrary simple password here. Then if we use systemctl, we can uh, look at the status for SSHD. Luckily, and I think this is kind of brilliant, this ISO ships with an SSH daemon. So to continue the install from another computer, be it a Windows machine with PuTTY or a Mac or Linux box, all we've got to do is say systemctl start SSHD. And if we run the status command again, we can see in the logs that it is listening on port 22, which is exactly what we want. Now, assuming you have another computer on the same network, if you choose to, you can now go to that computer and complete the install in your familiar environment. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do now. So I'll flip over to my desktop. This is another Linux desktop that I use as my primary desktop. And I'll start off by just SSHing in. So I'm gonna SSH into root at 192.168.194. We'll hit enter, we'll verify the identity, and we'll type in that root password and that's it 
Now from my machine, I'm gonna be able to complete the Arch install. I've got Tmux loaded so I can open stuff up locally. I've got my web browser available. So if I need to pull anything off of the wiki, I can do that as well. And we're pretty much set. So let's do this thing. So. First things first, we need to take a look at the disk layout. That is the most important part. And we're gonna run this command lsblk many, many, many times throughout this, okay? So lsblk or list block devices has given us a view of all of the disks. We can see the main disk and then all the Windows partitions that went under it. Now it's time for us to put our Linux partitions in place and you have many tools you can use to do this. I'd recommend using CG disk. I think it makes things really easy. And to get onto the right disk, you just need to specify dev, which is stands for device in Linux, and then put in the disk. So we have NVMe 0 N1, which is the disk, and CG disk will open this really nice interface that lets us start the formatting. Now there's things like F disk and a bunch of other cool ways you can set up partitioning. I just happen to like CG disk. It helps me kind of conceptualize if I'm doing things right. So first thing just to notice, partition two is the EFI partition. Don't forget that. We're gonna need that a little bit later when we set up Grub. We're gonna reuse this partition. But now we need some new ones. So for the free space, I'm going to start off by hitting new. Keep the first sector as the default. The size in sectors is going to be 512 megabytes. I'm going to keep the file system as default, which just makes it a normal Linux file system. And I'm going to call this partition boot. And then I'm going to do the same thing in the next free space. So I'll go down to free space, new, I'll hit enter. This time I'll leave sectors empty, which means it will fill up the entire remaining space. I'll keep it as 8300 or Linux file system and I'll call this root. So this is what our file system partition is going to look like. It's actually pretty simple, or I should say our drive partition. Um, we've got number two, which is EFI, a very important one. We've got boot and we've got root. Now boot has been separated from root. This is an optional step, but the reason I do it is we're going to be setting up something called init RAM FS or the initial RAM disk. And you can put boot in root, but I like boot to be completely unencrypted. And the reason is when you log on, it will bring up the grub menu. You won't have to put in a password. You can just choose Linux or Windows. And then based on your choice, it'll take you to either Veracrypt to unencrypt Windows or through the Lux setup we're going to do to unencrypt Linux. So I think it makes the setup much simpler in my opinion. I, I prefer this layout. There's a ton of fancy things you can do. You can set up these things called logical volumes and break it up even more intricately. But for me on a desktop machine, that's really kind of overkill. I think this does a great job of getting everything we need in place. So I'm going to go and write the file system changes here or write the partition changes. And with that in place, if you quit out of here, let's do LSBLK, list block devices again. And now you can see you've officially got two new pieces inside of here. You've got P5 and P6, which we'll refer to. So again, our key partitions are P2, which is EFI, P5, which is uh, boot, and P6, which is the root file system. So most important thing we start off with, let's encrypt P6 because we want this to be a fully encrypted setup. So we're gonna do crypt setup. We're gonna do Y to ask for our password twice. We will do use random, which uses dev random to generate the keys. We're gonna do Lux format, which will do the encryption. And then we're gonna do dev and point it at the P6. So this will encrypt P6. It wants to know if it's okay to overwrite the data. We're gonna type yes in capital letters. Put in the passphrase twice that we'll use to unlock this disk in the future. And there we go. So we've got an encrypted disk. Now at first glance, it's not going to look much different, but the key thing to know is you can kind of think of this like a, a metaphorical lockbox. Now P6 isn't any good to us unless we open it up and map its, its kind of root file system to something that we can access. So to do just that, the first thing we need to start off by doing is run crypt setup. We need to run Lux open against that particular drive. So this will be P6. And then we're going to do uh, a kind of an arbitrary name here to identify it. So we'll call it crypt root. We'll put in the passphrase and now we should have this set up. So let's do LSBLK again. Crypt root you'll notice is now available underneath this. So again, we've unlocked that lockbox and we've got crypt root available. Another thing you'll see is under dev mapper, there is now a reference to crypt root. So the important thing is whenever we reference the actual root file system, we're gonna do it through this dev mapper thing. So kind of the sequence is, while maybe not technically perfectly correct, you can think of it like you go in, you unlock the box, you make sure it's mapped to this dev mapper location. And then this kind of pseudo location is where we go 
go to access that that root hard drive which again in my mind keeps it somewhat clean even if it's not a perfect technical explanation. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to mount these things up. So again, we know P2 is EFI, P5 is boot, and P6 is root. So let's start with P6. To mount P6, we're going to mount it into this ISO so we can start doing installs. We're going to actually, you know, before we even mount, I, sh I should mention one step I'm kind of thinking uh, is going to give us issues. We need to make sure there's a file system set up on these new partitions, right? So let me, let me back up a step here. So you have a command on your machine called MKFS or on your ISO uh, drive where you can make different file systems. So I'm going to make an EXT4 file system. You can look up these types. EXT4 is probably the most common for Linux. And we're going to start off by giving NVMe5, which is the boot partition, that particular file system. So ext4. Now you'll see some different opinions on what to use for the boot partition. Honestly, um, ext4 works fine. You just need to make sure your bootloader is compatible with that file system type. So ext4 is great. And then we're going to basically do the exact same thing for p6. Uh, but remember, we can't really interact with p6 directly anymore. It's like a locked box for us. So what we need to do is go into dev mapper and get that crypt root. That is the mapping that's from the that lock box, right, for p6. So it'll create the new file system. And now we're here. So we've got file systems for P5 and P6. If you're wondering at all why I didn't do P2, remember that this already has a file system from the Windows install. And it's probably running something like FAT32 uh, because that's how Windows sets it up. And I think actually Linux prefers that for EFI. I can't remember what the default is for EFI off the top of my head. But nonetheless, we're looking pretty good. Now we're ready to start mounting stuff. So we need to mount P6, P5, and P2. Many of you already know that in Linux, there is a default directory you usually use to mount things to, which is mount. So the idea being, if we could mount like the crypt root or P5 or P6 in to this directory, we could start installing files and writing things and they would actually persist to that partition. So let's start this out. If we do a mount, we will start off with the root. So dev mapper, and this will be crypt root. And we're going to do this against mount. So the way to think about this is if I start writing files into mount, like this one here that we're going to need to write. So let's do mount boot. Now inside of crypt root, that has been persisted in that partition. So that is that is saved on the file system. Now it's not just local to the ISO. So I made a boot directory intentionally because now we're also going to mount P5. P5 owns that boot directory. So let's do dev NVMe. Let's grab P5 and we're going to do this on mount boot. OK, we're going to do make directory one more time. We're going to do mount boot and make a EFI directory, which is kind of the canonical setup with with Arch. It's going to expect things, although you can configure it to be in slash boot slash EFI. So we'll mount one more time and you probably know where I'm going with this. EFI is P2. So let's select P2, go to mount, go to boot, go to EFI. And now we've fully mounted the system. So if we clear this out, I'll show you another visual. Let's list block devices. How this is set up is it's basically saying everything in root is going to belong to crypt root. Another way to think about that is everything in root is encrypted, except mount boot has its own partition, which is P5. And then EFI has its own partition, which is P2. So things that live in these folders will be part of different partitions that will be unencrypted. Now you've actually done most of the groundwork to start the installation process for Linux. And to start the installation, we're going to be using a tool called Packstrap. Packstrap lets us put a bunch of packages in kind of like Pacman, but it's going to let us specify kind of a root directory. So it'll pretend like it's living in that new root and installing the packages. Now you might wonder, well, how do I know what packages to install? One of the kind of beautiful things about Arch in my opinion is you get to compose the packages you want, which I, I absolutely adore that concept, right? So if I go in and search for Linux, I can find the Linux package and you know, I probably want the Linux kernel, right? So that seems like a pretty important package to install. There's a couple other really important ones like base and base is going to give you some of the kind of core set of functionality that you'd expect in a, in a Linux system. Now you could theoretically go in and put all of your packages you want for your desktop environment in here. I prefer to not do that. I just have a list of ones that I prefer to start out with. And then after I get the environment set up, I run a whole nother script. I'll, I'll probably make a video for that where I install all the desktop environment stuff and, and blah, blah, blah. But first we just need a, a reasonable base system.
So what do I install usually? So Linux is pretty important. There's also a package called Linux firmware that I find to be super helpful as well. The base package, as you saw, is pretty important. And let's we'll actually break down a line so you can see what's going on. There's also a base devel. Uh, so this is base developer, which means it's going to have some build tools and things that it brings in. You don't need these per se, but I find them super helpful. Along with base devel, you even need things like Git and uh, Vim, because I want to make sure I have those available. It's so minimal that you even need to have your, your editors available and stuff like that. Now, really importantly, we need to make sure we install Grub, because Grub is going to be our bootloader. And then EFI Boot Manager is important as well. That'll help set up some of the EFI stuff. There's also a package called Intel Ucode. So if you're using an Intel-based processor, this is the microcode that runs with that specific processor. And then with that, we should be pretty well set up. So I will hit enter here. And if you've ever run Pac-Man before, this probably looks pretty familiar. We're basically running these package installs against mount, and we are effectively installing Linux with this command. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. So you might, you know, be a little overwhelmed with like, how would I know what packages to use? Well, Arch on the wiki obviously gives you some base ones it recommends. On my website, in the description, I have all the ones that I just showed you as well. Probably the biggest package I'm missing right now is anything regarding networking. I'll show you how I set that up uh, once we get further into the system, but don't think that I've, I've forgotten about that yet. So once this is done, we're going to go in and set up some of the file system table settings and get a little deeper into the system config. All right, so now we've got all of our base packages installed and we're going to start doing some configuration. So first thing is to run a command called gen fstab. This is going to create something called a file system table. We're going to do dash u for using UUIDs to specify the disks. We're going to do it against mount, but we're going to save the file or really root. And we're going to save the file against mount, etsy, and fstab. So if you're not super familiar with this file, the good news is it pretty much just gets set up for you. But taking a quick look inside, this is going to give some details about mounting partitions, which is pretty cool. So you can see you've got your crypt root in here. You've got the boot uh, in the middle there. And then at the very bottom, you've got the EFI system as well. So I guess one thing worth calling out, you may have been aware that I didn't actually do anything with swap space. Swap space would usually show up in here. And when we did CG disk, we would have allocated some swap space. Um, you can read a bit about swap space. My too long didn't read on it is in modern systems, it's not really necessary. It was a feature that when you ran out of memory, would let you page to the hard drive. I have zero use for it. I, I never use swap. It's, it's not that important to me in my desktop environments, but if it is important to you, it might be something worth considering. So. We've got the file system table set up. Now, for the first time, we are able to enter our new Arch Linux system. Now, you're not just going to reboot yet. You're going to run a command called arch to root, and you're going to do that against the mount directory. And when you hit enter here, this is a command, if you've ever truded before, that's going to kind of take your process. It's going to put you inside a mount and make you feel like you're in that new system, which basically we are. If we do a quick ls, this is your brand new Linux system, so so welcome. <laughs> so all we've got to do here is set up some basic configuration. This is pretty mundane stuff, so I'll just kind of blast through it. But first, we're going to create a symbolic link, and this is for the time zone. So inside of user share zone info, you're going to find a bunch of folders with countries, locales, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do, for me, MST, which is Mountain Standard Time. And we're going to put this in Etsy local time, which is where the system expects to find a symbolic link to this time zone configuration. Configuration. Um, in fact, if you just do a quick uh, cat of this here, uh, you can see it's got some information about like what the time zone settings are and all that stuff. So it's just going to kind of respect that for us. So next thing we want to do is sync the hardware clock to the system clock. So we will do uh, sync to HC which is just a command that we do for any install. And then we're going to set up some of the locale information for kind of the language and character settings. So we'll do Etsy locale E gen. And inside of here, there's going to be a bunch of examples. They will usually have a country and a language. Most common for you US people, you're probably going to use ENUS with UTF-8. So if you just search for that in here, you'll find a line that's commented out right here, and you'll just uncomment it. That's it. That's how you're going to tell it that, hey, I'm going to be using this uh, setup with Unicode and English US. And then you can just run a command called locale gen, and it's going to generate the locale pieces throughout the system based on your settings. Now, this one's a little funky. I'm not super sure why locale gen doesn't do this. There's probably a really good reason, but it also recommends 
that you add inside of a file called Etsy locale conf, a environment variable that says language equals EN US UTF-8. Again, this should kind of match what you had just set up in locales. You can kind of see that up here. So take this setting and be sure to write this lang environment variable inside of Etsy locale. So we'll hit enter there and that should be pretty good. So the last thing for config on the system level and kind of the most fun is you get to name your computer. So this is my laptop. I'm going to call it taco. So if we echo out taco, we're going to write that to Etsy hostname. And this will be the host name of your system. So we'll write that in and I've just named my system. That's it. Okay. So now we're going to do the last couple steps. And these are the most in the weeds that the installation gets, but don't let it intimidate you too much. So the first thing we need to do is set up something called init Ram FS or the initial Ram disc. This is a minimal root file system that boots up in the initial, in the, in the beginning off of that boot partition, and is going to be able to do some different stuff to get us access to our full Linux system. So to edit the configuration before we generate its config more or less, or images, I should say, we're going to open up Etsy MK and it's cpio.conf and you'll find a section in here called hooks and inside of hooks there are a bunch of let's let's just call them like modules if you will uh, i guess kind of like packages in a way but we'll say modules that will let you do certain things now normally you wouldn't have to touch this file but the reason you do is you have an encrypted hard drive so before the file systems section right here we're going to add a module called encrypt. And for all intents and purposes, you can think of this like a module that will be available in a NITRAM FS that's going to let you decrypt the hard drive. And then the other thing we're going to grab here is the keyboard module. And I've been doing this for years. I don't know how necessary it is anymore, but I remember back in the day, I used to need to make sure the keyboard hook was before uh, the encrypt hooks so that I could access my keyboard before decrypting. I don't even know if that's technically valid, but I still do it today and it, it works fine. So I move keyboard up right to here and uh, someday I'll have to look into that and see if it's even necessary. Nonetheless, this is the hook configuration. This is all the modification we need to do to this init RAM FS piece of your Linux setup. So we'll save this file and then we just need to run that MK init CPIO command with the preset set to Linux. And it's gonna go through, check all of our hooks. You can see it picked up the encrypt hook that we had set up in there. And if all goes well, it's gonna generate these uh, images for init RAM FS to kind of boot up in. And it is going to place those in the boot directory. So now we've got these in the unencrypted boot directory. Now, the last thing we need to do is set up Grub. And kind of the crux and most challenging part of Grub is frankly mapping the UUIDs correctly. So what I typically do to make sure I don't mess this up, there's a command called blkid or block ID. And I paste this out into the temp directory in something just called id.txt so that I can you know, lose it after the install, but can persist it while I'm going through this config. So if I hit enter here and then go into tmpid.txt for you, I'll do a no wrap so you can see this a little bit easier. These are all of my partition UUIDs. So P5, the boot, would be this UUID, right? Uh, partition 6, which is the one we're primarily going to care about, will be this UUID. All right, so I'm going to reference these UUIDs to make sure that the bootloader settings work correctly. So if you're not super familiar with bootloaders, just think of it in a simplified way of like, you get a menu, you choose something, and it kind of knows which partition and drive to go to and what to do to kind of kick that off. Let's, we'll keep it at that description for now. So what we need to do here is head into the configuration for Grub, and that lives inside of Etsy default Grub. Okay, so if we edit, enter this file, the most important line for us is this grub command line Linux. Now, in the documentation for when you're using uh, uh, cryptography or encrypting your drive, the ArchWiki has a good snippet you can paste in. I've also got it in my website for this step. It will look something like this. So basically what you're looking at here is we need to paste in the device UUID for the encrypted partition. This can be something that screws people up. We're not doing it to the mapped root. We're not doing it to P5. We're not doing it to P2, the encrypted partition, which is P6. So you might remember that block ID we copied earlier. So I'll just go ahead and delete this for now. So UUID equals, and we're gonna use Vim. There's a command called SP that you can use, which will split. And we're gonna go to TMP 
and then go to id.txt. I'll set no wrap one more time for you. And if we find P6, you now can see that this is the UUID of P6. So we need this UUID to be in this command line settings. These are uh, kernel parameters that we're effectively sending in. So with that pasted in, we've now got the UUID being referenced and we've got root being set to what will eventually open up, which is root dev mapper crypt root, okay? So let's get out of here for a moment. And I'm just gonna make a mention of this. You might also notice grub enable crypto disk. You only need to set this setting if your boot partition is encrypted. So the most common case is people will put boot and root together. Again, I've tried to explain why I choose not to do that. Nonetheless, if you did do that, you need to uncomment this or else Grub won't be able to unencrypt to access its own menu and you'll never actually get to the point that we're setting up here. So I'll save this again, not making a change to Grub crypto disk. And now we've got the grub config in place. And the last kind of intense configuration setting we need to do is we need to make grub aware of one, that there should be a menu option for Windows, and two, how to actually load Windows itself. So to do this, if we look inside of Etsy, grub, D, uh, in this folder, there's a bunch of these kind of settings that you can put in, and there's a 4D custom where we can add our own menu items in here. So if I run this command one more time, I'm gonna do a vim, and I'll go in and do 4D custom. In here, we can paste in whatever we want. So what I'm gonna do, I need to set paste in this terminal. I'm gonna paste in something that comes from the ArchWiki's recommendation, again, on my website too, which is basically gonna say, here's a menu entry for Windows 10. Here's a couple settings for what you would need to do to kind of load up that EFI. And then we're gonna change these pieces right here. Now, the example that comes from the wiki assumes you want to boot into Windows, which is sort of true for us. But what you have to remember is we have this backed, or I guess behind the Veracrypt encrypted disk. So we actually wanna to point to Veracrypt's EFI directory, okay? So I'll show you first, we'll just we'll just set up the chain loader as kind of the first step here and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. So I'll just save this file, we'll come back to it. Let's do an LS into mount boot. Or sorry, we're not we're not in the mount anymore. We're in the root file system. So it should be boot EFI. So there's the EFI directory. So that's where the Microsoft example was starting. And then if we do EFI, we can see we've got Microsoft and Veracrypt. Now we know we want Veracrypt. So let's do that. And in Veracrypt, you can see the DCS boot EFI file. That's what we want to reference. So in short, this is our file. Now, I'm going to explain in a moment why you only need the EFI, the uppercase EFI part and on, but let's go into the file first and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. So inside a chain loader, I will pop that out and paste this in. Now, what's going to end up happening is we're going to have this menu item search for the UUID of the EFI partition. So do you remember where the EFI partition is? It's P2, right? So if it knows to start at the EFI partition, this whole boot EFI thing doesn't mean anything because boot EFI is the root of the EFI partition. So if we delete this and put a forward slash, this is where the chain loader needs to know to look. We need to put in the FS ID. I have a cool little grub probe command you can use to get this, which is kind of neat. Obviously we'd want to change this to the whole Veracrypt setup, but reality is it's actually, you don't really need a fancy command to figure this out. We already know what all of our UUIDs are, right? So we need to put in here the, the UUID for P2. That's it. So remember that text file, right? We'll do another split. We'll do temp and we'll do IDs.txt. Set no wrap one more time. And then after doing set no wrap, you can see inside of here, P2 has this UUID. That's it. That's all we need to make sure the search works. So we'll grab the P2 UUID. We'll paste it in. And now we've got the setup as is or as we need it to be. So we'll save this. And to kind of finalize all the changes we've made to grub, we're just gonna run two commands. So I'll clear this out. We're gonna run grub install. And grub install will assume that you have kind of a um, canonical EFI location. So it's assuming it can find EFI, EFI on boot EFI. If you did something special uh, to your EFI location, you might need to pass the EFI flag, which will let you specify the location. And then along with grub install, we're gonna go ahead and run grub make config, uh, which the output file is going to be boot 
grub in a new file called grub.cfg. So that will set up the grub config, make sure it points to the init ram fs, um, as you can see inside of here, and it's got everything we need with the Linux image and the uh, init, RAM S init RAM fs fallback image as well. So, so far we're looking pretty good. Okay. Now, what do we need to do? So there's a couple kind of extra steps that I like to do before I switch over into the system. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to install something called Network Manager. Now, you can find tons of contentious debates about whether Network Manager is a super bloated Network Manager. Arguably, it probably is. I use it. I think it works totally fine. So if we do a quick Pacman, we're going to do our first Pacman install here. So Pacman s we're going to install Network Manager. Network Manager is 100 megabytes, and it's going to install a bunch of utilities that will let us connect to the internet when we reboot. Um, it will have things we need for Wi-Fi. You can see WPA Supplicant is a dependency, which is going to do uh, WPA negotiation. It's all inside of here, all looking pretty good. So uh, Network Manager is now installed. And then to make sure Network Manager works, we're going to do a systemctl enable Network Manager. And basically, this is a way for you to say, on boot up, I want Network Manager to start and start managing my connections and interfaces and so on. So with that, when we reboot, we should be pretty good from a network perspective. Now, a couple more things that I like to set up before I reboot. First, I like to set the root password because it would suck to lock yourself out. So we'll just put in an arbitrary root password here. We'll also add a user in. So you probably want to add yourself now. I put myself in a group called Wheel and put my name in as the user. And then I do password for my name, which allows me to put in a password for my specific user. Now, when I log in as my user, I obviously want sudo capabilities. So I'm going to run a command called vi sudo. And vi sudo actually came in with that base develop package you might remember. And in vi sudo, there is a little line that basically, if you uncomment it, it's going to say, hey, anyone in the wheel group is able to uh, run any command as long as they can put their password in. So it's another way of saying that I can use sudo as a wheel user. All right. And that's about it. So now we've got a user, we've got a base system, we should be pretty good to try and reboot. Now, I will say you want to exit out of Arch to root, right? So you're going to be back in the ISO now. And for safety purposes, I'd highly recommend that you unmount everything in the mount directory. So we'll umount dash r mount. And if we do lsblk, you can see that all of our partitions are still here, but none of them are mounted. Now, this is probably the most nerve wracking part of doing an install, actually rebooting and seeing if it works. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to flip a reboot and I'm going to switch my screens over and let's see what happens. So switch over to the, uh, the capture card here of the machine. It is now rebooting. And when we boot back up, we should be able to tell whether we're in our system. Okay, so that's good news. First off, we can see we've got our menu. We've got Arch Linux, we've got Windows 10. Let's start Let's start with a quick validation of Windows 10. I think that's probably the easier part. So great, Windows 10 just chain loaded over to Veracrypt. We can type in the password here and hit enter. And if all goes well, we'll uncrypt through Veracrypt and then get into our Windows 10 installation, which is, exactly what we'd want. So let's give it another moment here. See how it goes. Okay, we're seeing the little Windows circle. So far, so good. Okay, still a black screen. Come on, Windows. There we go. So now through Grub, we're able to open up Windows without any issue whatsoever. That looks great. Now, if this was normally a new install, I'd probably give Windows its like, you know, 10 hour period of doing updates that it usually needs to do. Um, but for now, I'm not going to bore you with that. And I'll just restart Windows so that we can ideally get back to the Grub menu and then try to boot up into Arch Linux instead. So again, giving it a little bit of time, we're booting up again. And there's our grub menu, very good. So we'll click Arch. And if we could only be so lucky that this worked the first time. So, all right, that's good news. So what it's telling us here is, hey, uh, I need a passphrase to unlock P6, which we know is our partition. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in that passphrase and it will pull through. And we're at the login, which is great. So we've got Taco, that's my host name. Sorry that the text is so small, by the way. There's not a whole lot important to see here. But if I do Josh 
and I log in, that all looks pretty good. And now I should be set. Now by default, I'm probably not connected to the internet, but again, remember we enabled that network manager thing. So one thing that you can do, and there's a ton of ways to do this, you can type in, I know the text is tiny, nm, uh, let's see, is it mntui? It's been a while since I've used this, nmtui-connect. And it will bring up a graphical interface that looks like this, which then you can select your Wi-Fi network if you're not already on Ethernet. You can type in your password here and hit OK, and it will attempt to connect your machine to the Internet. So I'll go ahead and quit now. And if we clear out again, you might not even be able to see this because the text is so tiny, but it looks like I've got an IP and now I should be able to ping Google.com. Um, that's it. So you have a fully functioning Arch desktop and you have a fully functioning Windows desktop. Now, all you've got to do to give yourself a desktop environment is head back to, as you might remember, that uh, that package manager website, right? And figure out what package manager, or sorry, not what package manager, but what package you want. So you could do like uh, GNOME. It's a pretty heavyweight but capable desktop, um, which would be in here somewhere. So uh, GNOME, let's see. Oh man, there's all there's a bunch of sub packages too, but there's going to be one for like GNOME desktop. Um, a lot of people really like i3, which is another uh, another desktop that you can use. So i3 window manager. So all you've got to do to get a graphical environment is use Pacman and do Pacman S and install the environment. In fact, the machine you're seeing right here literally went through this exact same process. The only additions that I haven't told you about is there's extra packages I install to do development work. And then I also install a window manager. In my case, I use one called DWM to kind of set myself up. So I'll make a separate video on how to kind of configure the desktop environment on top of Arch Linux, just because it's a whole nother, whole nother can of worms. But before I leave you, um, in case something went wrong with your install, I want to show you how to get back in and troubleshoot the failure. Okay. So let's say that hypothetically you booted up, you know, ours seemed to go pretty well, but you booted up in this case and, um, you know, something, something went wrong. That's not happening here. Maybe you realized like, oh man, I forgot to install Network Manager. So that's actually a great example. I forgot to install Network Manager, and obviously I can't just run, you know, Pac-Man install Network Manager because I don't have internet, okay? So to get back into the ISO and set ourselves back up, all we've got to do here, okay, is we've got to start off by just typing in reboot. And when it reboots, we're going to hit F12 in our system again, which is going to hopefully bring us back to the boot menu. The idea being we can always boot back into the USB drive. And this is why people usually keep their USB drives around. Okay, we can boot back into the Arch USB drive. It's going to look quite similar to what it did before. Um, let's do the, just so you can see it, no mode set. Uh, no, sorry, no mode set one word video equals 19, eh, 1280 by 760, let's say. All right, cool. So we'll make sure the text is fairly big again. And we're obviously not going to start from scratch and install everything because <laughs> that would make this video very long and painful. But we're going to basically get ourselves back to that state we were in where we're in the ISO, but still mounted and using the Arch, um, the Arch uh, kind of install that we set up here. So we'll give it just a moment. It's going to take a second to uh, to boot up here. Okay, so to get back in here and troubleshoot a failed install, you pretty much just need to remember the steps we took when we did the install. So obviously the first thing I'm gonna tell you as I always do is to start by listing the block devices. And this will give you all of the block devices and disks. And what we need to start off with is just like before, opening P6, because unless we unlock that box, we're not gonna be able to do anything. So we'll start off by running the same command, which will be crypt setup, lux open. We're gonna point it at P6. Okay, and then we're going to arbitrarily mount this, or not, sorry, not mount it, arbitrarily name this crypt root. And then if we put in our password, we've now opened up that box, right? So again, we'll do an LSBLK. We can see crypt root is now available. And just like before, now we need to start off by mounting or remounting all of the files to the appropriate partition. So we'll start by mounting uh, the dev mapper for crypt root 
into the mount directory. We don't need to make directories this time because they all exist, right? So we just need to make sure we mount things appropriately. So dev uh, p5 is going to be the boot directory, as you might remember. So this will be mnt, this will be boot. So that's mounted in. And then lastly, we're going to mount the EFI, which you know very well is p2. So p2 is going to go to mount boot EFI. Okay, so we'll clear this out. And we'll do LSBLK for sanity check. You probably noticed that right column. It looks familiar. We've got everything mounted in the correct locations. And now you can pretty much start working on your system again. In fact, we can just run that same arch to root command on to mount. And now you're back inside of your system. So if you wanted to use, you know, from previous previous steps, we had used like Wi-Fi menu before to rooting. You could use Wi-Fi menu, get back on the internet. In fact, let's let's literally do that. I think that's a good example. So if I do Wi-Fi menu here, um, it's going to scan for networks again. And once it scans, I will choose my network, this, and then I will go ahead and throw my password in here. Okay, now that that's sorted, I should be on the internet again. So this uh, ISO has internet connectivity using its built-in Wi-Fi menu. We'll trude in, and you know, hypothetically, I know we said we forgot to install, um, we forgot to install uh, Network Manager, which would be a much more you know reasonable uh, kind of qualifier for why we'd be back in here messing with stuff. But you know, while while this isn't really a realistic case, let's say for some reason you really needed to install. Um, I don't know what the Python package is called. Hopefully it's just Python, but let's say Python. So we can come in here and it'll be like, all right, cool. So you want to install Python. We'll hit yes. And when we reboot into our system, um, this will now be installed. So again, if you replace Python in your mind with something like network manager that lets you help get on the internet, you might've forgotten that step, come back in here, install network manager, and then on next reboot, you'll be good to go. So once you're done playing around, again, you wanna exit out of the arch to root, you still have things mounted, so you always wanna unmount with the recursive flag on MNT, and then you wanna reboot your computer. And once again, when it reboots, even though you've made some of those changes, you're gonna be able to boot back up. Using Grub, you'll be able to choose Arch Linux or choose Windows accordingly. We'll just make sure that that still comes up. So there's Arch and then we are pretty much good to go. We log back in, now Python will show up there and we're set. So like I had mentioned, I'll cover in a subsequent video how you set up the whole desktop environment. I just don't wanna muddy this up, but I hope you found this really helpful. I mean, we, we did a lot in a short amount of time. We installed Windows, we configured it, we encrypted it. We then completely set up Linux, fully encrypted it, set up a base system. And now we've got a system where when we power on, we choose between Windows or Linux, we boot one up and we're pretty much good to go. So if you found this video helpful, I'd super appreciate a like. It just gives me a sense of like, do you like seeing more of these Linux videos or more development oriented videos and, and so on and so forth. But regardless of whether you like it, I'm just stoked that you watched it. So hopefully you found it helpful. Um, leave a comment below if you got any feedback or ideas for me that could make this install process a little bit easier. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.